Hello, everybody. Um, I'm here today with Adele Anderson. And Adele is a life coach, but she is also one of my one of my writers in the Opal Rising magazine. And I am so thrilled to introduce you to her today. Adele, tell us a little bit about what inspired you? What was the catalyst that that got you into life coaching? And what and what do you focus on? Yes. So when I was in 27 years old, I was in a small plane that crashed and flipped in water. And I began to drown. And at, um, you know, the story is, is in Opal, so you can mm -hmm. read the whole story. But the essence was, is that my body ran out of oxygen. And my life flashed in front of my eyes, my my spirit separated from my physical body. I felt like I'd been to the other side. So I had this near death experience and, you know, 90% nine, of all the criteria that is written about for NDE was also my experience, but I survived obviously. And it was an amazing, um, you know, if you ever want to, to, to learn about choice, <laughs> you're gonna find it in a near death experience. So that really set in motion my desire to find out why I survived. And I found that the solutions to my survival in neuroscience. And so that um, took me through um, NLP training, neuro linguistics programming training. And, and then I wanted to share it with others. So how, to, how would I do that? I thought the best way would be through getting a life coach certification. Uh, you know, I can't imagine, um, I myself have never had a life, um, a near death experience, but, um, but you also had another, uh, another experience that, that I think, uh, we would all really like to, to know about. And it, uh, it's the grief, um, that you experienced. And, and I think you do a lot of grief work, um, in your life coaching as well. So what happened there? Yeah. So I do focus on emotional pain, trauma, um, grief, because I, I lost my husband last year. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It was a short and dramatic process of him, you know, 246.4, shrinking down to, um, you know, probably 160 pounds, barely able to carry his own weight. And then he died. And that was um, very traumatizing. I'm sure for him, I mean, he was remarkable with his um, ability to be kind through the whole process. And that also struck me as well, what, what power do we have and the choices that we make when we're going through difficult situations in life. But also I recognized that there was such a need in the marketplace for people that are struggling. We struggle with all types of pain. And I'm writing a book right now called Everybody Hurts. And this is really a passion project for me. I want people to, to understand that there is help out there, but also through neuroscience that we are, we are um, built for happiness, put it that way. Our, our brain is designed for us to be happy. And yet people get stuck in their trauma. And there are really simple and effective ways that we can start to free that energy. And we, we know through mind science that everything is energy, including our thoughts, including our emotions. And so when we are trapped in, in some type of trauma, we really are learning tools to bypass what we cannot change and work with the with the trapped energy. And so maybe that sounds um, harsh in one way is that, um, you know, if we listen to the science behind it, the devastation that we feel is so insurmountable and so um, connected to our neocortex, which when in trauma, doesn't have the ability to source information to help ourselves. And so the, the gist is that we have to bypass that mm -hmm. if we cannot change the circumstances of what um what was and the result is that we're holding trauma in our body then we we bypass the event and we deal with the trauma and and that is a body mind and soul solution mm -hmm. and 
I dedicated myself for the last two years of not just Willis's um, dying, but then after his death and the catastrophe of um, a landslide of emotions that occur, um, you know, body, mind, and soul with the loss of a, a major uh, love in your life. So there is that, um, the first of everything. There's yeah. the decision, there's the loss of self-confidence, there's yeah. the confusion in decision-making, there is just so much that goes with it. Just being able to go out for groceries can be mm -hmm. a trial. Just getting out of bed can be a trial. So yeah. there is a process and there is obviously the, the need for time to pass and mm -hmm. But there's also the cautioning is not to allow the trauma to go chronic. So when uh -huh. we first experience emotional pain, it, um, it can interfere with our mindset. So we feel mm -hmm. sad. We feel weepy. We feel lack of energy, lack of motivation, unable to make a decision, we, you know, change back and forth. But after four months, it's like a physical illness yeah. Um, it it has the ability to go chronic and when it does mm -hmm. and I can pretty much how do you know when it when it's gone chronic it becomes a part of your personality oh okay mm. so you become your trauma you live your trauma every day mm -hmm. so if something has happened in your life that has created a major um, uh, impact, body, mind, and soul impact. Yeah. And you, and you're still feeling the, it still feels fresh. Mm -hmm. it changes the way you think. It changes yeah. what you do to engage in your life and to find joy. It changes every aspect of who you are. And so we can limit our expression of who we are and limit our, the joy that we are able to source in our life if we haven't taken um, the time to actually move through the trauma and clear that energy. How long does it typically take to, to, I, I don't, I don't know, um, to stop feeling that pain? Mm -hmm. I just spoke to some, a, a widow Mm -hmm. um, it's 11 years in and she's still hurting. Yeah. And, you know, um, having a full, rich, loving, engaging life is not unloving. It's not unloving the people that are gone. Um, and if they were here, they would be whispering in your ear, um, that yes, go out and find joy, that your joy is, is their joy. And yeah. because of my near, yeah, my near death experience and a lot of spiritual work mm -hmm. over the past 18 months, um, and the science is there, like it's so far past, uh, our belief systems, mm -hmm. you know, Robert Lanza, who's one of the most uh, top 10 influential people in the world, according to time magazine, um, he's likened to Einstein and we can read it through sages through the ages and there's so much science behind it but he said there's no there's no more talking about it <laughs> it's like yeah. it's so far beyond um, our ability to ignore that energy cannot be created or destroyed mm -hmm. it transforms into something else and that was my experience um, when I separated from my body mm -hmm. it was just um, you know, I was a beam of light um, without a physical body. So I believe it is part of our evolution to move forward or move um, into that sacred spiritual space where we continue our journey and our learning mm -hmm. um, just without this body. So there's, exactly. we've heard, we've heard many books, um, one, you know, one soul, many bodies or many bodies, one soul. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and the science now supports that we are infinite beings. And so um, even though we can't see our loved ones every day, mm -hmm. I believe that they are um, supporting us and um, there for us when we ask. 
It's so difficult, though, even though we know on that spiritual level that they are there with us and they're they're supporting us and they're they're there. It's so difficult to to not have them in the physical with us. I find that the hardest, the hardest thing to to accept. Yes. And I and because we've met before, I am I understand, um, you know, the how personal that is for you and the loss that you've suffered losses. Um, Mm -hmm. And I agree that it's, it's um, intangible, but I once wrote an article for you. You did. Over (laughs) morning coffee Mm -hmm. and maybe consider that, um, you know, that perception shift. I, I had noticed as I was having morning coffee that the sun was catching the face of my watch. And as I moved my arm with my morning coffee, this orb of light was traveling across the furniture and then it hit my sliding glass door and it disappeared. And yet I could, in that instance, just reverse the, the angle that my watch was playing with the sunlight and the orb was there. Mm-hmm. And so then that information within my brain said, hey, um, what else am I not seeing? Or yes. what am I not allowing myself to experience? Mm-hmm. And we know now through neurology that visualization is our connection to the divine. And so yes. through um, quietude, like being quiet, sitting, giving yourself time just for you. So that's self-care time and setting an intention through visualizations that we can connect. And the more we connect, the better we get at it. Mm-hmm. Our intuition is there too. Mm-hmm. Which again, um, you know, maybe intangible, but we have so much intelligence within that, that intuition brain our gut brain, our heart brain, we always think that this is the only thing that's working for us. And it is, it's working a hundred percent on our behalf. Mm -hmm. It's only purpose is to keep us alive physiologically and to do exactly what we ask. And so when our language reflects something outside of what we want to achieve, it will move towards that too. And so potentially we can then limit, um, our abilities to feel comfort in the pain, to feel that continuity of ourselves and engage in that spiritual side of being us because we've limited our beliefs. Mm-hmm. Our words that we're using is, ref- is a reflection of that. So they are always illuminating what is truly happening inside the mind. The words that we choose to talk to say our story every single day, mm-hmm. if there are tries, if there are maybes, your brain doesn't yeah. know what to do with that. But if we say, oh, you know, I am versus, um, you know, I would like to be, right. then again, we're limiting our brain's ability to like to move us towards that information. So we should really be a lot more conscious of the words that that come out of our mouths. You know, there. That, yeah, it's it's called signature language. So please feel free to Google that or connect with me. Um, but the signature language are the top 20 words that you use every day. Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. So are they positive? Are they wishy washy? Mm-hmm. Are they in limbo? Are they limiting your joy? Are they combat words? Because that's fight right so we're we're setting up through the words that we use we're setting up the physiological um, download of chemicals and hormones into our bloodstream and then we're feeling the expression of those words within our body so I just read an article I'm not quite sure if it was psychology today but anxiety Mm -hmm. you know anxiety is now classified as the number one mental illness and so we're recognizing you know the things that we um that we think of as benign Mm -hmm. and whether we own it or we 
feel it is different. So I could say, I am anxious and my brain's going to just drop yeah. all types of um, cortisol into my system. And I'm going to start to feel that uncomfortable energy versus even I feel, I notice I feel a little anxious today. And so that oh. is a different expression for your brain mm -hmm. and to just recognize actually labeling it is okay for this short time. Mm -hmm. If it continues to feel anxiety, then it's not a healthy spot to, to live in because we're flushing negative physiology. We understand that our physiology, especially when negative, has the opportunity to engage with our DNA. And it can turn on or off the, the genetic markers of predisposition. So we, you know, we already know that stress and anxiety is the leading indicator for heart disease. Well, why do they say that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, heart disease is also way out there as far as, um, you know, creating a lot of um, death and a lot of grief on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and why is that? And, and what I, what I encourage you to do is just to recognize the words that you're using through your signature language and then recognize how you're feeling inside your body and then take steps to neutralize if, if you are feeling anxious or anything that's on the negative plane. So we can make it simple. Mm -hmm. On one side is your fear, your flight or fright and all of the negative emotions. And on the other side is love, joy, happiness, ease. Oh. So it's pretty clear, you know, that like there's shades, maybe shades of mm -hmm. depth of on both sides. Mm -hmm. But if we keep it simple, then we can just say, am I feeling love today? Or am I feeling something else, uncomfortable? And then we have a chance yeah. to change that dial. Mm -hmm to tune into the other side and how we can do that is um you know to think of happy thoughts and people say well if you're depressed it's hard to think of a happy soft thought so I say well okay um maybe there's a picture of you holding your granddaughter for the first time mm -hmm. a picture of you as a baby mm -hmm. and take a look at the picture and just look at the joy that's within the picture and within a few minutes within a few seconds actually you will start to tune that that dial over towards joy, happiness, um, inner peace. Yeah. And make yourself happy. Much and it, it does work. I've tried it myself. So yeah. I, I know it does work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adele. Um, for everybody who's uh, watching this today, I'm going to have Adele's uh, contact information at the end of at the end of this program and um and your book information as well so thank you so much Adele is is always such I love talking to you you are so calming uh, this has, this has been such a beautiful conversation I've enjoyed it too and I hope that um, your listeners find some value there as well thank you so much and goodbye everybody bye